morning and welcome to worship. It's a brand new year, 2023, and the Christmas season officially ended last Sunday, the 8th of January on Epiphany Sunday. You would have heard our new uh, assistant minister, the Reverend Kim Brown, uh, preach her first sermon. If you were here on that particular Sunday, there wasn't a video taken. Uh, it's a bit too early in the year for us to process videos. But if you haven't met Kim already, you will meet her this Sunday when she's leading worship or when I'm preaching. Uh, just a couple of notices to draw to your attention. Uh, the first one is that on Tuesday the 24th of January, the Life Group leaders will be meeting from 6.30 to 7.30 to talk about the year and what the different groups are doing during the year. So please, if you are a Life Group leader or a representative of a Life Group, please make a special effort to be here. Uh, we'll be meeting either in the kids zone or in the, the link. You'll see us as you come through the door on that evening. And then secondly, our retreat on Saturday morning, 28th of January at the Christian Brothers Center in Paradise Cliff from 8 o'clock in the morning till just before 1 o'clock. You're very welcome. There's only 18 spaces and I know some, um, there's not much space left, but it is on Henry Nowen's uh, idea that if we exercise hospitality, God invites us into God's inner life. Listen now as the scripture reading is read for us by Antoinette Beck. Today's reading comes from Genesis um, chapter um, 25 and it is verses 19 to 34 and I'm reading from the New International Version. This is the account of the family line of Abram's son Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethel the Aramean from Paddan Aram, and sister of Laban the Arm Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew, I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he wrote an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, then got up and left. And so Esau despised his birthright. This is the end of the reading. Thanks be to God. Amen. Today we begin a new preaching series. We finished the Christmas season and we're on to something brand new. And the person that we are focusing on is the Old Testament character Jacob, whose story is told from the middle of the book of Genesis to the end. Jacob is a giant among the so-called patriarchs, the fathers of the Hebrew Scriptures. First, He's one of the top four. Israel referred to their faith as the faith of Abram, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. It was built on these four fathers or patriarchs. It was a family line that God chose to develop into a great nation that he could use as an instrument of grace in his hands. Jacob's story dominates the second half of the book of Genesis. He is born in Genesis 25, and 13 chapters in all are directly about him. Compared to his father Isaac, Jacob is a fully realized character. Jacob is complicated, and he's very human. 
Unlike Isaac, Jacob is not passive. He's always involved in the story. He makes the story happen. His conflict with his brother Esau begins even in the womb, where supposedly they were wrestling with each other. When they were born, Jacob comes out holding Esau's heel. In fact, the Jewish word, the Hebrew word for Jacob, Yaakov, shares the same root as the word for heel, as in the heel. But it can also mean a cheat and a con man, as the English heel can mean. And Jacob is a trickster. He is a man who schemes and plots. He's always looking for the advantage, always wants the upper hand, especially when it comes to his brother, a little slower, Esau. What's in a name? Well, maybe if you think you're a heel or a trickster, maybe if your name means that, then you start to act like that. Maybe you adopt this identity. Maybe it becomes who you are. And maybe you start behaving like your name tells you to behave. Once a Jacob, always a Jacob. The story of Jacob and Esau is one of the most moving and beautiful and complicated stories of the Old Testament. It is a story of Israel moving from its second to its third generation. Rebekah, the wife of Isaac, was barren, which is always a difficult experience in any culture, but maybe more especially in the Middle Eastern culture, the ancient Middle Eastern culture, where everything was so driven by fertility. The crops, if they failed, it was hardship. If they succeeded, it was happiness. The, the animals, the livestock, if the livestock herd grew, you were rich. If the herd did not grow, well, then you were poor. It was seen as a sign of God's favor. But 20 years into her marriage, Rebecca falls pregnant. She thought she would never have a child. But here, all of a sudden, is a child. It looks like God often takes, makes our dreams come true when we think that nothing else can make it happen and we've just about given up all hope. The birth was peculiar because in, a, in the days of uh, no fertility treatment, it turns out that Rebecca, who couldn't have children, now all of a sudden is going to have two. She's expecting twins. And in verse 23, the story tells, The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two people will come from within you. And they will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the, other will, and the older will serve the younger. What a menacing prophecy to have at the birth of your twins. They were so different. The first one was apparently red in color, and he was very hairy. He was a skillful hunter, and he became an outdoorsy type. I quote, a man of the open country. His brother, on the other hand, was more delicate, perhaps introverted, sophisticated and quiet. I quote, staying among the tents. And of course, he was a man after my own heart because he enjoyed cooking. Seemingly, Isaac favored his older son, Esau, while Rebekah, the mother, had a soft spot for Jacob. Verses 29. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to his brother Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. This is why he was also called Edom. According to the scripture, Edom, the word for red. A red man liking red stew. Jacob replied, well, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, said Esau. Typical teenager thing to say. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear it to me first. Now, In those days, of course, the way you took an oath is you said it seven times. I give you my birthright. I give you my birthright. I give you my birthright seven times. 
So he swore an oath to him, says scripture, selling him his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some of his lentil stew. And Esau ate and drank, and then he got up and left. And the scripture records, so Esau despised his birthright. It is a bit difficult to read about a story where something so precious in your culture as a birthright can be given up simply for a meal. Now you remember that in ancient culture, male primogenitor was the way in which the succession happened. In ancient culture, it was always only the male child who inherited, and even then only the oldest one. I remind you of that story, that well-known story of the prodigal son, where the younger son asks his father for his share of the inheritance, and what makes it so brazen is that he actually has no share, only his older brother does. Only the oldest son inherited. It was an ancient culture. Male descendants were named while the, the daughters were never named. And it was the firstborn child who inherited. I read this funny story recently. In Executive Edge newsletter, the management consultant Ken Blanchard told the story of a little girl named Skia. Now, when Skia was four years old, her baby brother was born, and little Skia began to ask her parents if she could be left alone just for a few minutes in the room with the baby. Just she and the baby, the baby and her. Well, the parents were a bit worried. What would little Skia do when she was alone with the baby? Would the baby be safe? She might want to hit or shake him. Maybe she was upset because he'd taken her place as the center of attention. So they said, no, no, Skia, you can't be with the baby. Ah, you can be with the baby, but we, one of us has to be with you. But over time, they noticed that Skia wasn't showing any signs of jealousy. So they changed their minds. And they decided to let little Skia have her private conference with the baby. Elated, little Skia went into the baby's room and shut the door. But the door was open just a little bit so that the parents anxious parents could stare through the door just to make sure nothing was going wrong. They looked and they listened and they saw little Skia walk up quietly to her little baby brother who was awake and quite happy and then she put her face close to his and they heard her say this, now baby tell me what God feels like I'm starting to forget. Well, Jacob and Esau had probably forgotten what God felt like. And there was this battle between the two of them for prominence. Primogenitor. The, who would be the one to inherit? Surely Esau who came from the womb first. But no, after the bowl of stew. Maybe the scheming con man, the heel Jacob would take his place. In 2013, Queen Elizabeth II changed the act of succession from male primogenitor in England and Scotland and Wales to absolute primogenitor. So that every child born after uh, 2011 would actually stand in line to the throne, whether they were male or female. In the Stew incident, Joseph, Jacob became a con man. He took an opportunity. He changed a tradition of succession for Israel. He became the first one who was not first, but second and still in succession. Was it wrong? Was it right? Well, the main question is, who was going to carry Yahweh's intention forward? Surely not the one who exchanged his birthright for a meal. And the story of Esau would pan out all in the wrong direction. When God required him to take a wife from among the people of Israel, Esau ventured forth and married two women from the Ammonites. Time and time again, opportunities were given to Esau, and he chose to make decisions that were not in keeping with this God and his rules. What if Esau? What if the foreign wives? Well, I guess it's all pointless wondering. The question is, how will God make a nation with a con man at its head? 
How was God going to work with this Joseph, Jacob who seemed to take other people's things without them noticing? What was going to have to happen to shape Jacob into somebody that God could use? I can see some ways with hindsight, but I'm not going to spoil the story because the sermons that come after this in the next weeks will tell you how God changed a con man into a great leader for Israel and the father of the 12 tribes. What kind of a crooked person are you? What are the ways in which I have been a con man, changed the story, taken things that are not mine, twisted the truth so that it was in my favor? What did God have to do to straighten you out before he could use you? Isn't it a relief? Isn't it a relief that God can use the likes of us? Even a con man like Joseph, like Jacob can be changed into a powerful leader. Look what God can do. Raising children is tough. We always wonder what they will become. How will their lives turn out? Will they be able to, to have the wherewithal to, to live in a world like this? What will become of them? What will be different? Let me finish with this quote. As you think of the aged Isaac, and his two sons, Esau and Jacob. John Chrysostom, in his homily to the Romans, wrote this. If you wish to leave much wealth to your children, rather leave them in God's care. For he who without your having done anything gave you a soul and formed you a body and granted you the gift of life, when he sees you displaying such munificence, munificence and distributing your goods, he must surely open to them all kinds of riches. Do not leave them riches, rather leave them virtue and skill. For if they have confidence in riches, they will not mind anything besides. For they shall have the means of screening the wickedness of their ways in their abundant riches. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, when we think of this character who came out of the womb second, holding on to the heel of his brother, we think of all the times we have been duplicitous, scheming, working out ways to come out tops, while others must be satisfied with second place. And yet you used the likes of us. You shaped us. You made us different. You helped us to see the error of our ways. We said, sorry. From then on, we acted differently. Please continue to do this because we want to be instruments in your hand. We pray this in Jesus' name.